So um, again, thank you for joining us. Tonight's program is Creating the Sawtooth National Recreation Area, Politics, Art, and Activists with historian Tom Blanchard. Tom received his graduate MA degree in history from San Francisco State University before moving with his wife Florence and family to Bellevue, Idaho in 1977. He is a true public servant and he served three terms as a Blaine County Commissioner and was later Bellevue City Administrator. He has served on numerous civic boards, including the board of the Idaho Humanities Council and two terms on the Idaho State Historical Society where he was chairman of the agency for eight years. Please join me in welcoming Tom Blanchard. Thank you. Uh, so right away, I, I got to make an apology for the first one. You know, I, you put these PowerPoints together, and you, you constantly are editing them and editing them, and you always find you miss something, right? And so I'm looking at the Sage of Castle Peak, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is the saga of Castle Peak, not the Sage of Castle Peak, you know? So um, th there will be some technical uh, errors uh, involved here and some glitches. So if they are historical glitches, I'd love to hear about them. If they're technical ones, I. <laughs> You know, I don't want to hear about them. <laughs> okay, and, and the next complication that I have to deal with is that, um, excuse me, technology. I have a hard time reading this on the side, so I'm reading it right here, but I push a button and it changes the slide up there and then I gotta got remember to push a button so I can get my slide changed down here. So there may be occasional moments of confusion. So let, let me start out by pointing out that th this is a drawing uh, by Don Bemko. And, and for those of you uh, uh, that have been around the area for a long time, Bemko was a painter uh, lived in the Ketchum area and became regionally famous, probably the most famous local artist that we've had uh, of the area for a long, long time. Always doing outdoor landscape uh, paintings uh, and was regionally a, an important seller and a, a communicator of the beauty of our area. And so during the fight for Castle Peak, um, Don Bemko uh, Bennett gets on a helicopter flies up to Castle Peak, flies around Castle Peak, and takes a bunch of 35 millimeter films, and then has the audacity to land right in the middle of the mining camp, gets out in the mining camp, takes a bunch of pictures of the mining camp, and then he comes home and he draws this sketch, and it's a preliminary sketch, and if you can look right here, you can start to see he's sketching in the red lines of the mining claim right here, and this metal right here is really the um, Little Boulder Creek, the upper portion of Little Boulder Creek. And right at the lower portion of this metal area right here, there will be a 400 foot high dam that will contain the tailings pile. So this is an incomplete artist sketch preparatory to doing a finished product. And at some point as he's working on this, the politics of Castle Peak and the SNRA start to reach ahead and I think it became apparent that this thing was going to succeed and we were going to protect Castle Peak and as a result he takes this 19 by 32 sketch folds it up puts it in an envelope and sticks it up with a bunch of his letters associated with it and with his uh, um, you know some of the bulletins that have been out there and over a hundred newspaper clippings that covered uh, 67 68 and um, 69 and a few from 70 puts them in a box and just puts them on a shelf for a long time. And then, because for some reason, and I don't know what triggered this, he gave them to Dick Meyer. And Dick Meyer was also a very local uh, conservation activist in the area. And Dick, in turn, gave them to Lynn Stone. And I worked with Lynn Stone and Dick on a number of mining issues. And I've always tried to convince Lynn that she needs to take this material and get it in the archives at the community library, because this is our story. And so Lynn gave it to me and I got it in the library. So this, this is where that started. And I got this material about two years ago and started looking at it and accessing it into the, um, the community library archives. And as a result, I've put together this program. So we'll move forward here at this point. And we do that this way. Uh, Kristen had a book 
And I have a book, and the book that I depend upon for the history of the conservation movement in Idaho is uh, Defending Idaho's Natural Heritage uh, by Ken Robeson. Ken was, let me, <coughs> Ken was a um, Idaho statesman editor, journalist, uh, served in the legislature, uh, of course a conservationist and author. And about um, 2012, someone finally said to him, you know, you've you got to write this story down. And he, between that and four, 2014, he did write it down. It was published in 2014. And he really is an insider to the story of the SNRA and Castle Peak. As a journalist, uh, he, he really documents very well. He carries the storyline. He knows all the people involved, the personalities, the issues. Um, and so if you want to know about how this story evolved or the rest of the conservation movement in Idaho, um, his is probably the, the best book to go to. And let me go up here. So here we have the SNRA as it exists today, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it. The key here is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of places where we can start telling this story. I was speaking to one of the people from the audience is that actually the story of Idaho and um, parks, the park system itself goes back to 1872 when the first park, Yellowstone, was proposed by a senator from Idaho, William Claggett, uh, out of the Wallace area. And so the whole National Park Service starts from a senator here in Idaho, 1872. And in 1875, uh, the sawtooths were recognized as a possible next addition to that park system. Um, that got dropped, and it really didn't go any place uh, very far. But um, there were subsequent efforts that um, since that time have uh, evolved. About 1913, the uh, Women's Club in Boise um, were part of the National Federation of Women's and uh, Clubs, and one of their national goals was to promote parks and, and landscapes in the community. And the Boise Club decided that they wanted to promote the SNRA as a national park. And so really the movement for a national park in Idaho, and we're the only state that doesn't have one, and back in the 1900s at the turn of the century, we were the only state that didn't have one. And so everyone thought, we need a park, and the Sawtooth is probably the most important piece of geography that we need to focus on for that. And so they started this issue, and it was picked up by um, a number of people. Senator French agreed that he would introduce a bill for a park, and immediately he ran into some conflicts. And some of those conflicts that um, have been from, you know, in the SNRA issues right from the beginning. And they've really been user and resource basis conservation issues. And so when French in introduced it, he really raised the, a lot of hackles on the part of grazers and logging companies and things like that. And there wasn't much grazing going on up there, and there wasn't much logging going on up there. But still, the resource community of Idaho objected strongly, um, and he dropped that bill. Um, later on in the 30s, uh, Senator Pope raises the issue again. Uh, and again, later on, of course, in the 50s, Frank Church, uh, late 50s, early 60s, Frank Church raises it again. So the idea of a national park uh, with the sawtooth being the focus has been around for a long, long time. And, and finally, of course, was successful um, in 1972. Frank Church, uh, let's look at some of the players out here. Frank Church and the uh, Idaho Congressional Delegation, um, it's, it's hard to imagine how s successful Frank Church was until you sit down and read some of the things that he was able to accomplish, particularly in working across the aisle and getting people that really objected to his goals relative to the uh, park and the SNRA, um, or yeah, particularly the park, uh, getting them to work with him and addressing their issue. He just has an extraordinary history of success and being able to read the Congress and move things through here. And he wasn't supported all the time by the uh, Idaho delegation. Um, he had conflicts with a number of the delegation throughout his, the period when he was working to uh, promote conservation. Um, and in particular, one of, the, um, one of the things he had to balance with some of the politics in Congress itself or in the national administration. So the Forest Service 
versus the interior department, which was resource development versus resource conservation, was a critical issue in every time that a park was proposed or some change was proposed up there, the resource people were not interested in doing this. The Department of Agriculture was not interested in, in conservation issues. And um, every time the Forest Service won, in every argument from the time that started somewhere around 1913 up until about 1970, the Forest Service was able to outmaneuver the Interior Department. Of course, this gave Church some problems because he is on the committee, the Interior Committee. And so that when he's proposing things, of course, he, you know, he's looked at suspiciously by resource people. And it's one of the balancing acts that he has to work on constantly. Um, looking then in local politics here, we have as major players uh, in Idaho politics, of course, uh, Governor Samuelson and C. Sanders. Uh, Governor Samuelson had defeated uh, Governor Smiley. Governor Smiley was 100% in favor of uh, having a park there. Uh, Samuelson was not. He was a resource person. He thought that the park would limit way too much the ability to uh, graze, to uh, get timber out, and mineral resources. Now, again, with mineral resources, there are very few legitimate large-scale mineral sources that are available in this area. The Sawtooth uh, Mountains just don't have that large one. And the White Clouds have a lot of mineral activity, but not at the intensity or the richness that is necessary for a successful mine. So uh, as a result, they still wanted to keep it open, and there are claims, of course, all over the SNRA and the White Clouds that go back to the early development in the 1800s. So that's another, again, another one of those conflicts that Church had to maneuver through, and Samuelson, being governor, can direct the entire force of Idaho politics you know, in, in the direction of uh, avoiding a park or avoiding any restrictions on resource development. And then finally, uh, the players locally, and that's one of the things I want to pay attention to here because we had a really nice group of people here in the community that were active in advocating for the park and fighting for the White Clouds. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But they operated under the umbrella of the Great, uh, Greater Sawtooth Preservation Council. And those were chapters. Uh, we really had the first chapter, um, and then Idaho Falls had a chapter, and then the rest of the communities you can see there fell in line, each having a chapter. And they became very influential in um, lobbying and persuading church in terms of the choices he made. And a lot of times the choices he made were not ones that they supported at all, but they also recognized it. And he was very good at articulating the politics of the Congress as he tried to move these things through uh, Congress. Now we'll look at church, and I'm, I'm gonna step out here so I can read this a little bit as we go along. Uh, church is elected in 57, so he serves on uh, from 58, January 58 to um, 18, uh, 1980. He was on the Interior and the Foreign Relations Committee. Now, we, when he first came in, he made a very serious error in the first several months that he was in Congress. And he, Lyndon Johnson, of course, was the uh, majority leader in the Senate. And Lyndon Johnson had a bill that he wanted to get through that was taking care of some friends of Lyndon Johnson. And Frank did not agree with this one at all. And he voted against it. And Johnson refused to talk to church for six months. And so here you are, a freshman senator, trying to get things done for your community, and the majority leader of your party won't talk to you for six months. And Church just had to drop back, hunker down, and basically he became known for a person at that point that did his homework. Um, and when he spoke on the floor, when he lobbied other uh, you know, congressionals, when he dealt with the administration, he gained a, a a reputation for integrity, that finally Johnson turned around and said, you realize that he probably made a mistake with this guy. And eventually Church and Johnson, uh, Johnson comes to favor Church as a senator. Uh, they, were, they got along very well, and Johnson was very supportive of uh, Church's effort on a number, number of areas. Now, when Church first got to Congress, he focused on um, improving resource developments for the Idaho. Idaho needed industry, 
Um, now it had timber industry, mining industry, grazing industry, and so he did a lot to support all of those in his first two years in Congress. Um, and that begins to change after two years, and we'll go into that a little bit later, but he was uh, critical in terms of the Wilderness Act. Um, the Wilderness Act was introduced in um, uh, 1960, 61, and Church was um, going to, uh, he sat on the committee, of course, he wasn't the chairman of it, but when the bill finally came up in the Senate for uh, presentation, the chair of the committee um, had to go for a medical surgical procedure and asked Church to take over. And Church stepped into that role and ushered that bill through. And he did it so successfully that he became a leading national, recognized as a leading national figure in, for conservation politics. And it was a kind of a reluctant role that he got into in the beginning because he didn't enjoy those conflicts that he was in. But he was very successful at maneuvering between the resource industries and the conservation industries. Um, he was then the leader of the Wild and Scenic River Acts uh, and, and got it through in 68. Um, and again, the SNRA in 72, uh, he worked and was important in the Hell's Canyon Recreation Area. So he began to develop a series of successes in conservation movements in Congress uh, that, you know, I think, held him up in national politics. Um, and one of the uh, commenters, commenters on the, um, I think it was the uh, Sawtooth SNRA, was that 90% of the letters coming into that senator's, from his constituency, from outside of Idaho, supported this thing, uh, particularly the SNRA. 50% uh, from Idaho supported it. So Idaho, there was a lot of tension in Idaho. And, Church felt politically threatened a number of times as he was working with this bill, but he didn't let up and he was able to be successful on some really major conservation issues. Now again, the issue that he, some of the issues he really had to work with was that tension between the Forest Service and the Interior Department. Um, and to the credit of the Forest Service, while they opposed every act that he had presented, um, they did their homework and they really presented, you know, a, a reasonable platform um, that allowed them to be successful in the Congress itself. Um, and then what we see eventually is the Idaho sportsmen basically have come to understand how damaging the dams have been in the rivers of Idaho and the restrictions that they've had placed on the movement of the seagoing salmon and steelhead. And it's that r rising of Idaho sportsmen that really becomes the political platform that gives church the authority, you might say, the political authority and backing to move in, uh, move with the SNRA, but a n number of other damn issues that he was involved in. And I want to take a look at a few of these. This is, we've got Hell's Canyon Dam right there. And what we can see well, if you can read it, it's a little, it's, I can't get that type to go far higher uh, in my own uh, PowerPoint work. But um, if you look at the rivers in the Snake River, the first dam that cut off the salmon was the Salmon Falls Dam in 1910. And the first dam that cut off in the Salmon River, of course, is the one at the Yankee Fork Dam. And so we lose those sections upstream from the Yankee Fork, all of the spawning area in the upper valley, and then all of the spawning area in Nevada in 1910, as early as that, those had been cut off. And then if you look further, you can see that additional dams come in, and eventually the three big dams, but Idaho Power, ending with Hell's Canyon, basically cuts off all of the spawning area from Hell's Canyon, all the way up into our area right here. And there were some really significant runs up the Boise and up the Payette. Uh, Boise had a king salmon run at the turn of the century that produced, you know, the kind of fish that you see these guys where they hold them up here and it's a 45 pound, 60 pound fish, tail touches the ground. Boise had a run like that and we totally lost that as a result of those dams. But they weren't the only rivers uh, and you can see from there we've got the, the Payette River, the Black Canyon Dam cuts the entire Payette off at about the city of Emmett, it's just above Emmett. Um, we've got the Clearwater River. Um, they put a dam at Lewiston 
uh, just above the uh, power plant area where, where, where the, uh, uh, the mill is, or mill was, that in 1927 that killed all of the salmon runs going north on the Clearwater. Um, that dam was finally torn out, and then finally they settled on the Dvorak Dam. It's a very controversial thing for Church, uh, but he agreed to support in the long run the Dvorak Dam with the idea he would make a trade-off and he would prevent anything occurring in terms of hydroelectric or irrigation dams on the Salmon River and the rest of the Clearwater. And that was one of the political balances that he you know, engineered, you might say. So that by the time we get to the issue of the SNRA and the protection of the white clouds, we've lost the salmon runs and the, up, the North Fork of the Clearwater, all of the upper portion of the Snake River. Um, and it's estimated, well, right now, the Columbia Basin estimates is that 40% of the salmon uh, spawning grounds are gone because of dams. I, I think the Snake River, I haven't gotten a figure on the Snake River, but I think it's a higher percentage. But an enormous amount of salmon spawning disappeared because of the dams. And they tried fish ladders, but none of them worked. And, and we recognize right now that we have a hard time with fish ladders as it is today. But when Idaho sportsmen started seeing that salmon takes that were in the 12 to 14, 15,000 per year, I mean, these are sports fishermen catching that many, it dropped down to something like 8,000. And then lower than that, uh, with the, you know, as a result of these dams coming on, and it really united the sportsmen here in the Idaho area, and it gave Sam, uh, Church the, you might say, the platform, the political platform to move forward to protect the Salmon River and the Upper Clearwater River, and preserve those spawning areas for salmon. Looking, of course, at uh, our two governors. Samuelson uh, basically was strictly a resource development person. He was a sportsman, uh, he was a fisherman, he fished for salmon, um, loved doing it, but he still was uh, the major backer of logging, grazing, mining industries in Idaho and in particularly in the public lands. And uh, he had defeated Smiley, and then suddenly this upstart coming out of the Orofino area, uh, C. Sandras, came in and Cease immediately in his political life expressed support for uh, protecting the salmon and having limitations on the amount of dams. And uh, Cease Anders came from behind um, and beat Samuelson. It was a major flip in the politics of Idaho because the power of the Idaho government in terms of um, directing those agencies in terms of what their message is going to be completely turned around and where the Idaho government was totally resource oriented. Um, they moved into a conservation position with the uh, election of C. Sanders. And then here in our own community, and this is a group I want to take a little look at here, we started up here in the Ketchum area the Sawtooth Conservation Council. And that organization started in the uh, early to mid 60s. Um, and their goal was to have a park, SNAR Park. And, and when I say SNRA, SNRA Park, it wasn't that. It was going to be the Sawtooth Park. And um, you can see the, I'm, I'm going to move forward to this one right here. One of their major focuses, of course, ended up being saving the white clouds. But they were founded to support the national park system in the 60s. But they were instrumental in bringing attention to the efforts of the Sarco to open the, uh, the open pit mine up there, uh, right at the base of Castle Peak, and getting the white clouds included in the SNRA bill. Because all of this time, people were looking at the SNRA. No one was looking at the white clouds in terms of park protection. And it was really the Sarco mine that brings everyone's attention to the white clouds and uh, the Sawtooth Conservation Council then changed their name to join the Greater Sawtooth Preservation uh, Council and uh, join with those other five urban areas um, to produce political pressure, basically, to save uh, both the uh, White Clouds and the SNRA. 
And I want to take a look at this. You know, I, I was talking with Jay over here, Jay Dore, a minute ago, and you know, you go, you go through this list of people, and unfortunately, none of them are alive right now. And as I went through this list, uh, there's a lot of people in there that I ended up knowing, but I didn't know them because of their conservation effort. I knew them for other reasons. And so I never had an opportunity to talk to any of these people about the effort they made up there, you know? And I've, I feel disappointed right now that I can't go back and have conversations. It's like your family when you go through those old photos and you think, oh God, <laughs> What, what did they say this one? Who was that person? And I look at this right now and, and I realize that I missed some great opportunities here to have, con I had good conversations anyway, but I missed some great opportunities. But you can see the people here that were involved and, and lived here in the community um, who have now largely passed away. Now, of this group, I would point out Pat Bartholomew is the wife of Robert Bartholomew, the president. And Pat was a key person in lobbying in Washington in particular, so that when you see delegations going to Washington from our area, um, Pat is usually there and you'll see her pictures um, in, associated with meetings with congressmen and things like that. Um, I, again, Don Bennett, of course, and now we'll get into more detail on his effort uh, when he takes his flight up there. Doris Bennett sat on uh, the, our first PNZ committee um, that basically established Blaine County zoning subdivision ordinances. They're the ones that made the decision that we wouldn't have signs outside of the cities, that there wouldn't be any commercial or um, heavy industrial development in the Blaine County itself that should belong in the cities, that we need to work to preserve the scenic views of this area as opposed to developing them, you know, for commercial um, or uh, even hillside use. Um, Going down a little bit further, uh, there's a number of others. Oh, I, let me point out Jack Wilderman. Um, many of you will enjoy this. Well, I don't know many, whether you will or not. Jack um, was a person who worked with animals, among other things. He was on the ski patrol. But on his side, he worked with the animals in terms of rescuing animals that had been injured and then releasing them back to the, uh, you know, to the wilderness or to, you know, catch him where he, where he lived. And uh, one of his great releases was Jim the Crow. For those of you that remember Jimmy Crow, uh, Jim Crow, for those of you that don't know, was a crow that had been tamed uh, by Jack and taught to speak. And Jim Crow put himself around the community a lot and uh, would harass people. Now, all the kids who went to school had great stories of harassment. Um, there's a story in the paper about how the uh, uh, Ketchum Community Library was having their annual meeting and Jim Crow came in and, uh, you know, he'd, he'd go, all right, all right, you know, this loud croaking voice. And he had a number of other words that he would say too, some of which you probably wouldn't want to print or have in your public meeting. And the library board had to adjourn their meeting outside where they were meeting and move inside. Get away from Jim Crow. Uh, another woman told me a story about how they, their parents' cocktail hours were an important thing during that period. You know, people got together for cocktails, right? And so uh, she said her parents would have people over and they'd have cocktails and Jim Crow would come and land and he'd, he'd land and he'd look around and then he'd walk up and take a drink. <laughs> Pardon? I am not sure what his taste was and whether he favored anyone. I think he was real an independent drinker, maybe a little bit of everything. He, he would mix them up. Uh, Louis Stewart, of course, was the, um, the director of hospital, uh, not hospital, of hotel services at the Sun Valley Company. Probably one of the most sophisticated cultural uh, gentlemen you'd ever run, a run into your life. And, he could tell you no in a way that made you think that he made the right decision. I mean, he, he, he was really good at that. And that's why I, I ran in him uh, doing a remodel on the lodge uh, for a family. And he did not agree with what that family wanted to do. And he said it in such a way that you understood that, oh, this isn't what we're going to do. <laughs> it was very good at that. A number of these others, Richard Meyer, of course, uh, uh, Dick was a, he ran the uh, blueprint shop. Um, and uh, was involved in a lot of conservation issues. Um, George Saviors, um, a, a strong protector of conservation issues, very strong backer of protection for the Big Wood River. Um, 
uh, Paul Mathis the same way. So what we have is quite a list of local people that uh, really worked consistently and hard um, uh, to uh, preserve the values of the, both the sawtooths and the white clouds, but they were particularly effective in bringing it attention uh, of the white clouds in the Arsarco mine up there. Um, and then, of course, I want to get a little further into Don Bemko. Uh, Bemko moved here um, and with his wife, Doris, and they had two daughters, uh, Cindy um, and Trudy. And he took them all out with him all the time painting, so they grew up in the outdoors. Uh, and he was just constantly, in the wintertime, he'd ski out and paint or do his, he'd do a preliminary sketch like he did with that sketch of Castle Peak, and then come home and turn it into a, uh, a picture, of, a painting of the type. Um, <coughs> And this is from his obituary. This is one of the better pictures of Don Bemco. Now, Bemco, um, in 1968, early in 1968, um, knew about the uh, Arsarco mine work going on up there, along with everyone else in the console. This story had been broken by a journalist in the Salmon Recorder uh, newspaper. Uh, it was immediately picked up by the Chalice newspaper by the Post Register, uh, Rob Brady uh, immediately came, came out with an uh, opinion against it. Uh, it was picked up by the statesman, and so it immediately became a very hot issue. And as a result of that, um, Don hired a helicopter who landed in Haley, picked him up, and flew him up to the sawtooth up there. Uh, where he took a ride around the sawtooth and then went into the white clouds. And uh, he had his 35 millimeter camera with him. And so he took, and what we're seeing right here, um, he had those slides in that box with the stuff that he turned over to Bix. So there's a slide of the, the film that he took at that time. And so what we have here is both his picture and then those are his notes up here. This, so this isn't my language that you're reading up there. Those are Don Bennett's notes on his, um, his trip up there. Uh, so what we're looking at here right now is you're looking at the uh, little Boulder Creek area. Um, the white clouds, you can just see Castle Peak coming up right here, but this is the meadow down in here, wh which will be destroyed by that 400 foot uh, tailing stam. Um, and again, this one, we're looking at the base of Castle Peak. Um, Castle Lake is up, the, for those of you that know of Castle Lake, it's basically up into this dark hole you can't see right here, it, a beautiful alpine lake. There are a number of lakes up there. There's quite a few lakes around uh, the uh, Castle Peak up in that area. And these, of course, she's all taken from the, uh, this, this one, he's standing on the ground. He got, again, he got out of the, you know, he, after he flew around a bit, um, he got the helicopter to land in the mining camp. And we have a picture, he'll have a picture here a little bit later. Um, so he just is taking pictures in a sense of the landscape so that he can have it in his mind when he gets back to work on his drawing. Now the pond right here that is referenced is, is this little green spot right here. It's really an algae covered pond. It's, it's turning, you know, it's an old glacial hole and it's turning slowly back into a marshland and that's where the major drilling is going on right now for the white clouds and the white cloud camp itself is situated on this little rise right above here and they've gone in there and they've cut out enough trees so they can land the helicopter in there. The entire Asarco effort at that point and there were, they ran two crews, they had, they were drilling on two different crews day and night so they would um, drill consistently or constantly all day long and all night long. They had probably 68 people living in the camp up there. It was a fairly large camp. And all of the supplies had to be flied in, flo flown in by helicopter. And so they had a base. Eddie Baker has a ranch that's just down at the bottom of the little boulder creek. And Eddie leased his uh, pasture out to a Sarco. And so there's a staging area. But if you can imagine delivering all the supplies and equipment to run, they were running two drilling rigs. 
and then they had a uh, cookhouse and um, you know a dormitory, equipment uh, repair and storage areas. Um, all of the supplies for that operation had to be flown in by helicopter. Uh, and so now we're looking at we're looking down Little Boulder Creek. So the that edge right there is just shy of where the little pond was, where they're doing the drilling, and you can see Little Boulder Creek runs out this drainage here. Um, and that is where the, the key issue that really triggered, I think, the end for ASARCO was that they finally realized that they were going to have to do more exploration, they needed more equipment, and they wanted to build a road up there. And the conservation community recognized that if you get a road up there, you're never going to get rid of that road. You're going to basically have that forever, and it's going to bring people into the base of Castle Peak and ruin that particular area. And so what the mining company did, and this is typical of mining companies, is that the Forest Service was always very generous in allowing people to have access to their mine claims. So they claimed a series of claims that worked their way up the valley right here so that they could connect claim to claim to claim all the way up to where they were operating there at Castle Peak with the idea in mind they'd file with the Forest Service for permit to access their mining claims. And when that became public, the outrage relative to that effort or that technique of getting a road in there raised so much a ruckus that the Forest Service stepped back and Asarco stepped back. And Asarco finally made the decision that we, we won't build that road until the Forest Service has an opportunity, to do an, an opportunity to do what we now would call an, an environmental assessment or environmental impact statement. Now, this was before NEPA, where those terms come from. But in essence, the Forest Service said that they wanted to stop everything and do this study to see what the impact was going to be. And it was going to be a two to three year study. And ASARCO recognized that they were having huge objection. And so they willingly made the decision that they would set aside their operations until such time as that study was finished. And I think it, just about everyone recognized that that was the tipping point for the salvation of uh, Castle Peak and the White Clouds. Um, here you can just see the east face of Castle Peak. Uh, he's still standing up on that moraine up there. Um, there we have, uh, again, this is Castle Lake again from the helicopter. You can see the size of the lake. It's, it's a little difficult to figure out because the shadows in the upper end. Uh, the lake doesn't, doesn't go up that way in the blue area. It cuts across here, but it, it's a beautiful lake isolated up there in a hanging glacial canyon. And then there is the picture that really is the basis for his sketch. A Sarko had probably 150 claims or something like that up in there. It was a very large number. But not only was a Sarko working up there, any time a big company like that comes into an area and they demonstrate that they have an interesting um, asset that they want to explore, other mining companies tend to congregate around them and, and make claims. And you may not have a claim of great value but you might have a claim that is in the way of that major mine's development. And as a result, we had a number of mining interests up in the Castle Peak area making some very large claims at this time. And there are at least three different prospecting groups um, that are up in there making large claims at the time. So the whole area is being threatened, just not the uh, Castle Peak of Sargo area. And now here they have landed. You can see the helicopter, you can see the blade on it. Helicopter's right there. And you can see some of the uh, camping setup that they've got in there. And uh, they're clearing some trees. Uh, this little site here, of course, is where the helicopter comes in and lands. So all the trees in the front have been cleaned out. And you can see, and they went in and cleaned out of anything that was anywhere near the pathway of that landing zone. And here we have uh, more of the camp itself, um, just buildings, but again, 68 men living up there working two shifts with two drill rigs, 24 hour seven. 
Now here we have a picture they did, um, they, they could not fly this guy in with a helicopter. This is a bulldozer there, you can see him blades coming forward. Um, they actually walked that one in. In other words, they did a soft walk where people walk in front of it and in a sense direct the driver as to the best way to get that track vehicle up there. And so they walked this vehicle literally up, slowly up the little boulder uh, drainage. Uh, more road construction. They had to create a road to get these drill rigs in the place where they wanted to drill and test for minerals. Um, they had to, uh, of course, take a bulldozer and get, a, uh, uh, get the drill rig down there. Drill rigs are pretty big. And here now we have uh, what he describes as the typical vegetation, uh, white bark pine, hundreds of years old, old growth white bark, uh, now currently pretty threatened, I think, as a result of the uh, beetle infestation. Uh, one more of the Castle Peak area. Um, the meadow is again right in that uh, left lower f uh, corner there uh, where uh, the amount of tailings and, and the thing you got to keep in mind when you do an open pit like this is like the level of mineral concentration that's necessary for a successful mine is exceedingly low. In other words, if you look at the gold mines that are operating out right now, uh, something like a, you know, a, a quarter of an ounce per ton of material is sufficient to be commercially successful. Um, and so uh, up in this area, you, you're looking at a waste uh, where if you're going to move millions of tons of material, you're least, uh, you, you know, a very, very, very minimal part of that will come out as a concentrate that can be actually used for the extraction of metal. In this case, it's a molybdenum mine that they're looking at. Uh, interestingly enough, these claims were all the Eddie Baker claims. They bought the claims from Eddie Baker. Eddie Baker thought he had a silver mine, uh, you know, and but it doesn't matter to a miner. You know, I got something that, that shines well. They do, yes, yeah. They didn't. Oh, they, uh, yeah, Ed asked uh, or made the comment that the Bakers still have claims up there. Uh, part of the SNRA uh, language was that uh, no new mines could be um, claimed, which was a godsend. Um, the other part was that they would go in and re-examine all of those old claims to see that they were legitimate. Um, now, and then there, was, there were some claims that there were over some argument that there were over 7,000 claims out there. Um, I think that's a little misleading because a lot of times you get a mine or a mineral source that someone discovers and then they look at it and they say, this is too much trouble, but in the meantime they've made five or six claims on it and they drop them and then someone else comes in and reclaims them or sometimes you claim them wrong and you don't get the right direction to claim the mineral to protect you from someone on the outside coming in at it and so you re establish those claims. So 7,000 is probably an overestimate in terms of the number of claims. But when the SNRA was created, the first thing they did was hire a series of mineral examiners that will look at every one of these claims to determine are they legitimate. And of course, mining companies never worry about legitimacy before. Now, I don't know, it's rare for the Forest Service to look at a mine and ask whether this is legitimate. They just go ahead and if something develops, they'll work with them. Um, in the meantime, with the new mineral examiners, they had to demonstrate that they actually had a discovery point on the claim. I mean, the point of a whole claim is that you're claiming a mineral resource, so you gotta have a mineral there. And uh, what they did is with these 7,000 claims after eliminating the historical overlaps, and then going back and looking at all of the others over the next, oh, 10 years or so, this process was a long one, um, they ended up, I think there are something like 75 claims left in the area uh, right now out of, out of that 7,000 estimated. Um, and another part of this story is that the claims examiners are two cousins, one from Bellevue and one from Haley. Uh, so um, the Jones cousins, uh, um, Guy Jones in Bellevue, and uh, Jim Jones and Jim Jones in Haley, uh, Jeff Jones, Jeff Jones, yeah, in Haley, 
were the two mineral examiners, and both of these guys had gone and gotten engineering degrees and mineral exam uh, mineralogist degrees, and basically came home and spent the rest of their careers uh, examining these mines. So they were very positive miners, and they wanted to do as much as they could you know, to help these miners validate these claims. But when they got done, we ended up with around 70 claims up there. And that number is diminishing, as we saw a number of years ago, uh, a number of claims were given to the Forest Service by a party in the uh, up, um, <laughs> what, what the, you know, I'm gonna have one of these, but which one? Boulder Basin. Yeah, Boulder Basin. You know, a party came in here and I think they gave, uh, to the, gifted back to the Forest Service 20 claims in the Boulder. They were, pa yes, some of those were patented. A lot of the claims of that 7,000 were not patented. But in the meantime, of the 75, they're really grouped in two or three large groups. So the Livingston Mine has 20, 30 claims. Uh, Slate Creek has a large number of claims. Asarco still has a large number of claims. So for the most part, with the exception of three or four spots out there, uh, the claims have largely been eliminated in the SNRA. So Bembo comes back, makes the sketch. This is the original sketch. Uh, I had it scanned. Um, and because it was folded, of course, you get, get fold lines right here. And there was a lot of charcoal smudge. Um, and so Evelyn Phillips uh, graciously offered to uh, clean it up um, and uh, get it ready. And, and then we have uh, uh, this original copy is in the archives up there at Ketchum. And uh, we've made five copies of the original that I gave to co other conservation groups. Boulder White Clouds got one, ICL got one, because all of these organizations have their history associated with the success of protecting Castle Peak. Now, he quit working on this in 69. Uh, um, in the meantime, we don't get Castle Peak and the SNRA until about, uh, seven, well, not about, 72. Um, in 69 was the period in which it was recognized that the, the white clouds with the uh, Castle Peak uh, area needed to be added to the SNRA uh, effort. Because one of the arguments, of course, is that they are trying to get the park. Um, and the Forest Service being very successful in resisting parks because they didn't like the interior. There's just an intense animosity between agriculture and interior. Um, the uh, Forest Service had uh, suggested that we do a uh, national recreation area. And then in 69, it was all gonna be in the SNRA area itself, the sawtooth. And in 69, the white clouds were added to that, about 157,000 acres, I think, in the white clouds addition. Um, so that by 1972, the church recognized that he had enough, um, he had answered and resolved enough issues so he could get this successfully through Congress. And uh, it disappointed a lot of the uh, park supporters, including the local community here, who was favoring the development of a park as opposed to a national recreation area. But I think in retrospect, most of the people look at how parks have been overwhelmingly overdeveloped, um, and they look at the SNRA as a blessing. Um, now, the, the idea of getting a national park, of course, in Idaho is still out there, and the process of trying and advocating for that is still going on, and the, um, the focus of that is in the craters of the moon. Um, and there's an effort going on today and has been going on for 10 or 12 years to get the Craters of the Moon as a national park in Idaho. But, um, so at this point, I think I'm done with the details. Um, if there are, you know, and I know I missed a lot of detail, but, and probably didn't cr say them correctly at some point. <clears throat> so any questions? Yeah, Ed? I have a question, Either questions or comments, either way. I mean, if you knew any of these people on that list, I'd love to hear the stories about them. I knew, I was fortunate to know a few of them, and there are a lot of others that could have been mentioned, of course. But can, can you speak you, up a little bit? Um, I just wanted to point out something in one of your slides. You mentioned that um, uh, Mr. Bennett was working with Frank Church, I believe, to create the, the, the um, 
white boulder white clouds wilderness the boulder white clouds weren't wilderness until 2015 yeah. they were just part of the snra and it wasn't until mike simpson got his boulder white clouds bill passed in 15 that they actually became wilderness and I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I don't always articulate things so that they, they run exactly how they might have run, but wilderness was a key issue in all of these things. The reason they wanted a park is to give them protection, the equivalent of wilderness. So those people that didn't want parks wanted wilderness uh, under any circumstances. And it, um, the, the wilderness had been a mani manipulative issue in the sense that the Forest Service would use a wilderness as a so they could proclaim wilderness up till i'm going to say when did that change the forest service had the authority to create wilderness out of the primitive areas and so the forest service anytime they were approached to have some kind of an interior designation would up, literally create a wilderness as a um, alternative to the interior control of the public lands and they were very successful at doing that and created a lot of wilderness around here so that they created a wilderness um, you know in, in the um, uh, Selway bitterness area Bitterroot area um, they created one didn't, I'm seeing a sh head shake no I think they, they uh, did the uh, first primitive area was uh, the primitive areas, we had four big ones here in Idaho. But at any rate, Middle Fork area was one, the Selway, Bitterroot was one, the Salmon Breaks was another, um, and then they created an, another primitive area. But the Forest Service had the authority to create wilderness w without congressional approval. But they never called it wilderness, primitive areas, and they were done administratively so they could be undone administratively. And that's what Frank Church and Clinton Anderson and Scoop Jackson and the others wanted to fix was so that the Forest Service couldn't just, and the Forest Service was very crafty in how they did it. Mm -hmm. They would do it to forestall parks and, and the Inter Department of Interior getting any kind of foothold, but then they could undo the administrative action just as easily, and that's what the Wilderness Bill fixed in 64. That, that's correct. In fact, one of the ones that they undid was the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness, and in doing so, they blocked off a large section of timber that the timber companies would get a hold of, and there were a couple other favorite areas up in there that they lopped off from the wilderness that they had designated. and so. Naturally, everyone was nervous about the Forest Service in their ability because if one man designated it, uh, the next man in that job could undesignate it. And so the issue was, how do we get something that's more permanent in the SNR? And that's why the Forest Service, the Congress took the ability of the Forest Service to declare wilderness. Congress took that away. Yeah. Yeah, good, good, someone said. I, I, I would think I would agree. Although it's getting hard to, well, I don't know. We're seeing wildernesses coming out uh, quite regularly out of Congress, and we're not getting in the large blocks anymore, but we are getting smaller ones. And the, the white cloud wilderness was our latest here in our area. Any other comments, questions? Well, if not, thank you. and. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, I'm sure he'll be around a little bit uh, longer to answer any questions that you might not uh, want to talk about, right? you know. Um, so please, um, thank you so very much for coming tonight, and uh, we'll see you hopefully next week. Thank you.